This is Friday, mm -hmm. September 8th, 2017. Mm -hmm. We are in Melrose, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the ongoing Veterans Oral History Project based at the Morse Institute mm -hmm. Library in Natick, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. My name is Maureen Sullivan, mm -hmm. and we are privileged to have with us today mm -hmm. Beatrice Flagg Wadlin. Welcome, Beatrice. Thank you. So let's start with some background information beginning with when and where you were born. I was born here in Melrose on a Sunday, February the 12th, 1922, which makes me 95, almost 96. And um, I've been in Melrose almost all my life and since 1957 continuously. Um, I have a picture here of my father who was in World War I. I don't know very much about World War I because this is all over before I was old enough to talk about, but he was a soldier in Boston. I think it was called Fort Banks, and I know that it was involved with the horses because he got encephalitis. Uh, but he did live to be 80. It wasn't a debilitating disease that much. And what was your father's His name? father's name was Arthur Samuel Flagg, named for his uncle, and he was born in Wellesley, but he came to Melrose in 1904, so he considered himself a Melroseian. And what is your marital status? I am a widow. At this point, I got married in 1940. My husband died uh, six and a half years ago, almost seven years ago. And do you have children? I had four children. My eldest son is deceased. I have three children still living. Two of them already retired, and one of them is still working. Okay. Tell us about growing up in Melrose. Uh, well, I grew up in Mel the whole the whole time in Melrose. I had two sets of grandparents also living in Melrose, which was nice. And um, I went to the Winthrop School. I went to the uh, Calvin Coolidge School. I went to Melrose High School. I graduated Melrose High School in 1939 at age 17. Do you have any brothers or sisters? I have a sister who is now 92, and she lives in New Hampshire. She's in very good health, except that she is deaf like me. You have some stories about the Depression. Yes, I have a couple of stories about the Depression. Uh, it didn't affect me personally, really, because we had gardens and all. We didn't, we didn't suffer at all. But I got hand-me-down clothes from my cousin, and she and her mother liked green, and I never liked green at all. So I never buy anything greener than teal blue in, in this age. Uh, but my husband had several stories about it. Uh, his father had a store downtown, Jewelers. That's why we live near Main Street even today, in the house that his father bought. And uh, he, because he couldn't pay the rent very easily, the landlord said to him, Harry, if you will heat the building, forget about rent. So he paid the, and it, it probably was about the same amount, but he heated the building for all of the tenants at that time. But my husband had a real uh, depression story, I thought. He went down to visit his cousins, who also lived in Melrose, and their cousins said to their mother, can Robert and Philip stay for lunch? And she said, well, let me go see if I, what I've got in the kitchen. She didn't have any bread, so she went to Uncle Bill and said, can you give me a dime or a quarter so the boys can go get some bread for lunch? And he said, Ruby, I don't have any change at all, no money. So the boys had to go home for lunch. So to this day, in my kitchen, there's a little purse with dimes, at least a dollar's worth of dimes. My husband wanted left, so it was always there. When you were in high school, were you told things about Europe and Japan? I don't recall hearing about Japan at all. They might have. We did hear a lot about what was going on in Europe, but I don't know if we understood Hitler and what was going on. I, I don't, it, it hit us hard when we really found out what he was doing. Okay, four. 
And what did you do after you graduated? Well, I wanted to go into nursing, but I was 17. They wouldn't take me till I was 18. So I went in to help my father in the insurance business, and that's where I ended up. I did go to Boston University and take religious education courses. I did help as a volunteer at church for years, 40 years after that, as a volunteer. How did you meet your husband? In high school. I knew him before I graduated. And um, we were married very young because at that time, you, if a woman was married, she couldn't work. And so we went to Seabrook, New Hampshire, and got secretly married. My husband was in Northeastern University. He didn't graduate till 1943. And we would have been secretly married, except for Pearl Harbor. First of all, what's your husband's name? Robert Lewis Wadlin. And second, do you remember what you and or your husband were doing when Pearl Harbor was attacked? Well, we were, he was still living in this house and I was still living up on the hill with my folks. And it came over the radio and it came, everybody knew about Pearl Harbor. And the Elma Whittier, who was the draft uh, chairman or whatever at City Hall, got hold of Robert and said to him, you've got to announce your marriage because if you don't, it's gonna be announced for you because they have to put everything up in City Hall. So we were no longer secretly married. And I had to give up my job at John Hancock, come back to Melrose and work for Robert's father for a while. How did your parents react to that? Uh, I think they were, I, I think they were very surprised. I'm not sure they were uh, shocked because it was better than telling them that I wasn't married and we were gonna have some children, some grandchildren for them. <laughs> what did your husband do during the war? Well, he had, he was at uh, Northeastern till 1943, but that's a, a, a course where you have studies and then you work and then you go back and study and Northeastern sent him to General Electric. And he got involved in the jet engines. He was, he tested the first jet engine ever uh, manufactured in mass in New England in, mm -hmm. in uh, United States. Uh, was your husband's work considered top secret? Oh yes, I didn't know what he was doing. We could hear noise sometimes from Lynn, even here, and I. Uh, but we didn't know what it was, and I never asked him because I didn't want. I knew he couldn't tell me anyway. And he would stay nights. Sometimes he would stay nights. What do you remember about life on the home front? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't bad for us personally because he had parents here. I had parents. He had a grandfather. I had grandparents. We, we all, the family got together and took care of each other. So I don't know that we were very badly hit by it. You know, if it came to rationing, somebody in the family didn't need, you know, if you did, and so we shared. Okay. What do you remember about your high school classmates who served in the war? Too many of them died, and if I went up to on Main Street in Melrose, those names, I know most of them. Some of them were a class ahead of me, some of them were a class behind me. My husband was a class ahead of me. And, but most of those boys I knew. How did you get news of the war? Radio, yeah, mostly radio. But of course, there were letters, there were letters. But... Did you go to the movies? Not much. Not much. Uh, My husband did, and he could probably tell you a whole lot about the ones he loved, but no, I didn't. My folks were not very, uh, they didn't think movies were important. <laughs> well, did you have any favorites when you did go? No? No. no. Uh, how about uh, the radio? What were your favorite shows? 
I don't know that I had a favorite show mm -hmm. because we had the one radio in the, in the living room at that point. It wasn't as if I chose the, the programs. Either my father or my mother chose what was on the radio. Tell us what happened when the war ended in 1945. There wasn't any real celebration. Uh, it, everybody in Melrose, the, the newspapers came out with the headlines and all, uh, but they had a concert. Not, they didn't, you know, it was, um, it was quiet in Melrose. I think they were just relieved that it was over. Of course, in August of 1945 came word of the atomic bomb drop on Japan. Uh, what did you think about that? Well, of course, we thought, at first we thought it was terrible, but the war ended and actually it did save lives. So the end result was we thought he had done the, Truman had done the right thing. Yeah. And how long was your husband employed for GE with the jet engines? 40 years. 40 years? Yeah. He was 40 years with GE, but he wasn't actually working in the manufacturing end mm -hmm. of it. They found out that he was very good on hardware because one of the reasons that one of the jet engines blew up is they had put the wrong material and the screws, and the screws, little, little tiny hardware, had made it blow up. And so he worked on hardware and, and uh, quality control. You mentioned earlier that you didn't spend all your time in Melrose. We did. General Electric sent him out uh, during the war to both uh, Philadelphia and Schenectady when they needed an engineer. And then in 1952, he went to uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, and we were out there for five years. And that was not on the jet engine. They had him running an, an engineering library, and he uh, worked with that until uh, 57 when they sent him back to Melrose. It was all GE. And how was life in Cincinnati? No ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, Cincinnati was fine. People <laughs> were fine. The churches were fine. We, we had a good life, and the children didn't know the difference. But when they came back here, Kenneth especially, he was three when he went out there. Five years later, you see, he, he, he came here and he tasted the water. He said, there's no taste to the water, Mom. What's wrong with the water? I said, this is good water. It was the Cincinnati water that was no good. <laughs> but they, I, we got back here in time for our older children to be having junior high here, and Kenneth started school uh, out there. But he, in the elementary, I think he went second grade or third grade here. <laughs> so, so when did you guys get your first television? Oh, we were one of the first in the neighborhood. We lived over on Mount Vernon Avenue then, and um, when you got a TV and everybody knew it, they were very long and a very small. It wasn't as big as this picture <laughs> that you saw earlier. And all the neighbor children were allowed in. It was set up in our dining room, and they were allowed to come in, sit on the floor, and watch it. And then, of course, as other people got them, it was only last, it was, um, a, a real surprise to people for the first month or two, <laughs> six months maybe. <laughs> now, you and your family lived during the Korean and Vietnam Wars. Uh, what do you remember about that well, time? Well, I, I tried to think back to that, but you know we didn't have anybody in the military at that point, and we didn't really know what they were doing, or what they expected to accomplish. And even after it was over, I'm not sure I ever knew what we accomplished. Mm -hmm. So we didn't really have a lot. I had a lot more to do with Afghanistan because I had a step-grandson that was over there as a medic. And uh, he was married to my, my granddaughter. And we got, uh, but we had Skype then. So mm -hmm. at least we could see his face mm -hmm. and know he was all right. Did he come back okay? He came okay. back okay. 
So none of your children uh, did any military service? No. No. I had, gee, by that time, uh, my son that died early, they rejected him. He, he wanted to be in the Marines, and they wouldn't take him. So then he applied to the Army, and they wouldn't take him. And uh, he died at age 56 of oh. a very sudden heart attack. So they had seen something that we didn't know about. Mm. But he had a son who became a Marine before his father died. And he was very happy that his son could carry on where mm -hmm. he couldn't do it. And what's your grandson's name? <laughs> my husband was Robert Lewis yep. Wadlin, and my grandson is um, Robert Lawrence Wadlin, which is that so his father was Lawrence. And uh, what? He's still a Robert. They're both Robert L. Wadlin. Okay. And while he was in the Marines, uh, where did he serve? I don't know. Was there something called Desert Storm? Oh, definitely. I think that may have been part of it. He never talked about it. Mm -hmm. He's now a policeman. He used his, his uh, training to become mm -hmm. police. Uh, where's he serving now? Malden. He oh. lives in Saugus, but he's a Malden policeman. Okay. <laughs> so Beatrice, uh, is there anything else you would like to... Well, let me see. I don't think so. I think we've had quite a lot of... Uh, Oh, you asked somewhat at one time what was it like on the home front about having gardens and all? Yes. My husband, who was an in the engineer, <laughs> she tried to plant a garden. And by the time I went down to see him, he did it down at my grandparents' farm place. He was fertilizing the weeds along with the tomatoes. He didn't know the difference between the weeds and the tomatoes. I had to go down and weed his garden. He, was, he had a very good idea, but it just didn't work out very well. So he stuck the jet engines. <laughs> <laughs> oh, heavens. Beatrice, yeah. anything else? Well, I don't think so. None of my children were in the military, but my grand, you know, as mm -hmm. my grandson was. And um, I do think that's important. But uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen now. <laughs> I have uh, great grandchildren now, mm -hmm. and I hope there's no more war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a very nice way to end it. Beatrice Flagg Wadlin, we thank you so much for taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Well, I hope it's some help. <laughs>